Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Ivo Botsus and I'm a Senior Vice President and the Chief Technology Officer uh, of Xanix. When you look today in the industry, you can identify around like four important megatrends. Uh, one important trend is the scale out of the data center. Uh, the second important uh, thing that is happening is the transition of our wireless infrastructure to 5G wireless. And then there is also the growth of the Internet of Things. And one of the examples of that is actually, um, you know, the transition to autonomous cars or at least, you know, a driver assist uh, in all of the cars. And when you look underneath these technologies, you, you see that there is really some foundational trends that are supportive for these technologies. First of all, there is the growing importance of machine learning, artificial intelligence that without any doubt is only to grow in importance. Um, and then there is blockchain, blockchain which will enable in the future what I would refer to as the trusted internet, whereby you know we will rely on the internet, not just for watching videos or doing search and but also for having dependable applications that are leveraging the internet infrastructure, dependable applications, you know, that take care of our uh, safety and our health. So, and that really requires a, a trusted internet. Now, all of these trends and evolutions, they are impacting both the cloud and the edge. If you think about it, you know, uh, both the cloud and the edge have their origin at the same place, which is basically the PC and the desktop that brought computing to the masses. But then we saw a bifurcation happening, you know, where more on, driven by mobile uh, equipment and mobile applications, uh, ultimately resulting in the edge um, was one of the directions that the compute platforms were evolving. The other direction was more on the infrastructure side, where you know we now see that compute is being made available and scaled out in the in the cloud. Now, whereas these are both very important compute platforms, the kind of requirements that you see uh, for these environments are, are pretty different. I mean, if you look at the data center in the cloud, I mean most of the trans applications are transactional. The compute has to typically happen as fast as possible. And the whole architecture is built around the concept of being capable of scaling out the workloads to problems that can be handled by thousands of compute nodes. So bandwidth connectivity is also a very important component in that. On the other hand, you know, when you look at the edge, the kind of the figures of merit of compute are a little bit more uh, complicated in the sense that, you know, it's not necessarily that you need to compute as fast as possible. You need to compute real time. And real time basically means that, you know, you should not be too fast because if your platform is too fast, it means that you are wasting resources that, you know, could impact, for example, the size of your solution or could impact the power consumption of your solution. Also, the compute has to be deterministic. You want the platform to behave every time in the same way for the same function. When you press a brake in a car, you want to be that this is very predictable, that it always reacts in the same way. And when we're talking about braking, clearly it's not just about speed and bandwidth, it's also about latency. You want to make sure that you know, there is a reaction within a certain amount of time. So latency is a very important criteria. And then finally, power consumption is both important on the, in the cloud as well as in, in, in the uh, edge, but it's probably a little bit more outspoken in edge applications where form factors and, and the environment play probably uh, a more important role. Now, when we look a little bit deeper into uh, these different megatrends. Uh, the first one, of course, that we are all um, see or, or is happening is the artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, 
without any doubt, you know, machine learning is just at the beginning of how it will impact our world, and, and uh, it's definitely there to stay. Now, even in machine learning, you can already start seeing this bif bifurcation between edge and cloud. Machine learning consists basically out of two components. One component is the training component, where you are um, optimizing your neural network model and the weights in your neural network by, by a learning process where you kind of improve the parameters of your neural network to improve the accuracy of the conclusions that come out of processing the data through your neural network. Now, typically, you know, this kind of functionality requires a tremendous amount of compute. In this specific example, that refers to ResNet, which is a kind of a moderate complexity image recognition application. What you see is that in order to train uh, ResNet 50 for a certain class of applications, you typically need, you know, two to the uh, 10 to the power of 28 calculations, which is pretty much like, uh, you know, a quadrillion type of applications, uh, calculations. On top of that, you need a massive amount of data that needs to be manipulated and also data that needs to be stored. <laughs> so clearly, when you look at the characteristics of a, the training application, it calls for a scale out data center like uh, solution. On the other hand, when you're deploying your machine learning, which we refer to as inference, where you try to predict the outcome for new images and new inputs that are not part of the training set, you still need a lot of uh, calculations in these applications. Now, typically, inference is the deployment of the machine learning in the field, and therefore it's uh, more heavily constrained in terms of power, in terms of size, and in terms of the resources that are available. So efficiency of the computation and the data handling is very important uh, for these applications. When you are then see this against the backdrop of 5G, 5G clearly is uh, in a very early stage today. Um, you know, clearly 5G uh, is still an evolving standard um, and it will require a lot of adaptability in the architectures that support 5G. Um, now, the key thing that 5G is trying to do is, is to, of course, is increasing the bandwidth. You increase the bandwidth by uh, increasing the, the channel bandwidth, but you're also trying to uh, apply more sophisticated uh, technologies like beamforming which typically require a massive amount of compute. So beamforming in the, in the radio, for example, requires you typically about 300 times more compute than you see uh, in the past in, four, in 4G. And on top of that, this has to happen under pretty uh, severe latency constraints because 5G standard is supporting a latency reduction of a factor of 10 compared to 4G. So Clearly, and that all has to happen within the constraints of the size, the weight, the power, and the cost. Uh, that should necessarily not be higher, but potentially even lower than you see in, in, in 4G. So another uh, application that putting you know, very high requirements on future semiconductor solutions. And then you have the autonomous driving cars. Here you see a representative example of a, a kind of a, a compute chain in an autonomous car, which in this specific case um, takes input from about eight different cameras around the car and generates a data rate of about 30 gigabit per second. Clearly, that data rate is too high to send um, that information to the cloud to do any intelligent processing on it. So therefore, a lot of local processing in the car has to happen. The first thing you do is you reduce the, the amount of data so that it can be handled uh, to be processed by some of the machine learning algorithms. Um, then you perform compression. And although at the end of that chain, 
your data has been dramatically reduced, there's a second requirement, which is the latency. You know, you want a car to react, you know, within microseconds. Now, the typical latency of a, a 5G network is 10 microseconds or you know, tens of microseconds. So clearly also, although you have reduced the data considerably, you need to um, do a lot of the decision making and the processing locally in the car. On top of that, when you look at the characteristics that I put there on the bottom, which show the data rates and typically, you know, what is the amount of time you have to process one data sample, you can clearly see that there's a pretty high level of heterogeneity in terms of the characteristics of that compute. And as a consequence, in terms of the architecture that will handle these different compute problems, it's very different, you know, the data filtering which typically is very highly pipeline data flow, whereas the machine learning is massive parallel processing. And then, of course, at the end of the pipeline, you have a more traditional decision-making kind of architecture. So heterogeneity is another important component that you can identify um, you know, in this application. Now, a good example, I think, of what, if you want to look into the future, you know, a good place to go and look and, you know, what is to expect when we talk about the Internet of Things or Industry 4.0. A good place is, for example, the CERN Large Hydron Collider, which is a pretty complicated instrument that has about 100 million sensors that generates about 500 terabits per second of data. It's clear that it's impossible impossible to store all that data. So what you need to do, you have to basically process uh, that data and, and compress the data. Um, and you have about three microseconds to do that in this application. So once again, massive data processing, latency requirements, high bandwidths, but it shows you know, what is in front of us in terms of the explosion of data when the Internet of Things really comes to full fruition. I mean, a recent article in Science Magazine, for example, was stating that um, if we keep on storing data at the rate that we do today, the amount of silicon needed to implement the flash memory to store the data will amount to about 5 billion kilogram of silicon by 2040. 5 billion kilogram of silicon. Uh, that exceeds the worldwide silicon wafer production capability by a factor of 100. So it's clear we have to get smart about how we deal with data and not just about compute. Now then finally, when you look at the data center, um, you know, it's interesting by the way that we're talking now about data center and not about compute center when I was a student. I typically went to the compute center to do my computer science classes and so on. Um, it says a lot that people now talk about data center and then it, it reflects the importance of the data. Now, when you look at the traditional architecture of the data center, it's pretty much CPU centric. Now, the challenges you have as the requirements in terms of workloads and, and capabilities are increasing and more slow is not keeping up. Um, you have to improve the capabilities of these compute nodes by other means. And these means are you're creating heterogeneous compute nodes, which means you are augmenting the capabilities of the CPU with accelerators. And you're also uh, augmenting the capabilities of a compute node with uh, smart networking capabilities and smart storage capabilities where you do some of the data processing as the data passes through in the network, or where you do data processing, not necessarily putting your data, you know, sending it all to the CPU for the processing, but do some local close to the storage processing before you send it around. So ultimately this kind of um, trajectory leads to what I would refer to as a network centric um, architecture where you create a disaggregation of resources, which could be CPUs, accelerators, 
storage nodes and where you can have different workloads for different functions that are going to allocate the right combination of resources, be it CPUs, accelerators, or storage devices, and connect them in an application-specific way through an adaptive programmable network. So if you look at you know, the direction that data centers are going, you will see at the one hand the disaggregation of the components you know, the traditional CPUs, the smart storage, and then a heterogeneous set of accelerators that are connected with a very high bandwidth programmable uh, network. And you will then compose the right combination of resources depending on the different workloads. Once again, this requires flexibility and programmability at many levels of connectivity, of storage, and of compute. So, when, when you look at these megatrends, one of the observations clearly is that the demand that is being put on the semiconductor capabilities clearly is continue to increase exponentially. And this is happening at the moment when we are starting to witness the demise of Moore's law or the slowing down of Moore's law. So we have to look at other ways to, to cater to that. And one of the inspirations for this is um, actually another law that was postulated by um, a person called Kurzweil. And what Kurzweil law is basically saying, he's referring to it as the law of accelerating returns. What this law basically says is that we have in the history, we have seen a continued increase of compute power leveraging technology and and this started way before Moore's law started so Moore's law is just an episode in the trajectory that's been described by Kurzweil through Kurzweil's law and basically that is of course a very optimistic uh, you know, prognosis where basically Kurzweil is stating that you know we will continue to deliver this exponential growth of compute power you know, to all these applications that will definitely consume it uh, to its full extent. At this moment, you know, we, we are exploring many uh, options. There is DNA-based computing, there is neuromorphic computing, there is quantum computing. You know, what ultimately will be the winning solution is not clear. But in the meanwhile, you know, in the near term, we definitely are starting to look beyond Moore's law. And in many cases, people refer to it as innovation that's created by more than Moore's law. And more than Moore's law is a, a combination of, of um, new ideas and new technologies. Of course, you know, for those who can afford it, continue to scaling is still a very important mechanism to improve the capabilities of, of your platform. There's no doubt about that. But the scaling uh, of your silicon is now being augmented uh, by different technologies, including, um, you know, the in order to improve the bandwidth, we start seeing the emergence of photonics and silicon photonics. Without any doubt, you, this will be more prominent in, in future solutions. We see, you know, in order to deal with the explosion of data and the importance of data for, you know, getting the, the performance uh, in your systems, we see new memories, storage class memories is a, is a first indication of uh, the direction that the technology is going. And then finally, you know, whereas Moore's law was focusing on scaling in two dimensional, uh, 3D stacking technologies are basically extending that scaling in another dimension and clearly create opportunities to continue to improve uh, performance. That is also then combined with people are inventing new devices. You know, the first step was extending the transistor, making the FinFET transistor. Um, you know, people, a lot of people are, are seeing a lot of problems in carbon nanotubes. Um, so that's another angle in which we will see that we will continue to deliver uh, technology that will help in 
supporting that exponential growth. And then where I would like to spend a little bit more time on is on the architecture component. Because clearly, given the fact that we are you know, being challenged by the slowing down of Moore's law, you know, it's a time for thinking outside the box. It's a time for innovation. And as Hennessy and Patterson have shown that in their, in their presentation, they claim that we are now entering a new golden age of computer architecture. They believe that you know, the winners will, will be those who are really coming up with innovative, uh, creative, new architectures that will cater to you know, the specific requirements of domains. And so they basically uh, stipulate that the next era will be the area of domain-specific architectures. Right? And so that's, to a certain extent, what we are also looking into in Xilinx and how we are extending you know, our platforms into that direction. And I would like to you know, go a little bit more in depth in that, what, what we are doing and have been doing and what is driving us in doing that. Um, so you know, just a little bit of a repeat, what is an FPGA? I think all of you probably know it. And what, what do people like about FPGAs? Well, first of all, FPGAs are a very regular two-dimensional array architecture very well suited to take benefit of more slow. Um, so clearly, if we can, we want to hang on to that kind of characteristic of an FPGA. Another good thing about an FPGA, especially in the world where data is becoming so dominant and where data is defining the efficiency you know, of your solutions, FPGAs always have had a large amount of embedded memory, but more importantly even, that memory was distributed close to the DSP blocks, to the programmable logic blocks, so to the blocks that are manipulating the data. So the data was not sitting far away from these blocks, it was really close by. And then a final thing is that, you know, FPGAs were characterized by a very rich programmable interconnect where you could program different data movement patterns that were aligned with the application for what you were programming the FPGA. So these are all really good things and we want whatever we, we wanted to do, we want to make sure we were not you know, going away from, from these benefits. But at the same time, we had to cater to the requirements of you know, improving the computations per watt, the computations per square millimeter, and ultimately, computations per dollar. So, you know, the kind of things we were doing. Well, first, the traditional way and how people are looking into this is, well, you know, what we have done in history, we scale, right? You, you take an architecture, you get it to the next node, and, you know, normally you should see at least a factor of two uh, improvement. That's what Moore's Law was always, you know, delivering us. Um, now, this, this diagram gives you a little bit of an experiment we did. It's, it's already a long time ago. It was, as you can see, it was in, you know, more than uh, six years ago. Um, but um, we took our 60 nanometer product and we kind of scaled it to, at that time, 10 nanometer. Our current products are using 7 nanometers, so it was an intermediate experiment we did at the time. Um, but it took us another... Well, to be clear, you know, that scaling didn't give us what we would have hoped for. It basically reduced the die size. And remember, for just the regular array, which is the easiest thing to scale, it got us a 70% shrink in the die. Uh, the die shrink to 70%. That's definitely not what you expect, and that's definitely not the exponential benefit you would expect from more slow. So it took us then another six months, actually, or even more, seven months, to to really um, get to any shrinking factor that was close you know, to where we would expect it to be. And it was a very painful task, working with the hardware people, you know, redoing some parts of the architecture. Um, and, and that was only for the array-based. So clearly we had to start looking for new uh, opportunities to kind of deliver, you know, exponential benefits uh, to the customers.
And that basically led us then ultimately to what today uh, we call the adaptable SOC product line, um, which the current version in seven nanometer we refer to as the Versal uh, product line. And so what did we do in the adaptable SOC? Well, first of all, we kind of increased the density of the arithmetic by increasing the granularity of the basic building blocks in our array. So we uh, created an array what we refer to as AI engine cores, which were basically VLIW vector machines that were still connected in a very rich switch-based programmable interconnect, very similar than the FPGA. That was the first thing we did in terms to increase you know, the compute density, but not give up the flexibility of the programmable connectivity that you had with the FPGA. Now, clearly, you know, we gave up some of that. Uh, what we gave up was that this became a more domain-specific architecture. The other thing we did is um, we distributed uh, large chunks of memory very close to these uh, coarse compute blocks. These were memories that um, were not, just to be clear, these were not caches, right? These were like, you could refer to it as scratch pad memories or, or, or whatever, but the um, important thing is they were not caches. Um, what was also important is this architecture was a data flow architecture. In other words, what counter to a traditional multi-threaded architecture, in this architecture, it was the data that was initiating the compute. It was not the compute that was initiating the data transfers, right? Typically in a threaded architecture, it's whenever the compute stalls, it will fetch, you know, it will fetch on miss from the memory, right? And so that, is not what we did. We basically believe that as a lot of the applications we are targeting are, is its efficiency is defined in, in how the data is manipulated. Basically the data became the master of, of, uh, of the architecture. So, um, and then finally, to stay with the, the concept of the, the importance of data, we created uh, a dense memory on chip but a memory that was adaptable in terms of width, in terms of depth, in terms of size, in terms of bandwidth, so that you really could program your memory to cater towards specific applications at hand. This country to what you see in traditional multi-threaded architectures where you have a kind of a fixed cache hierarchy. So what is that this gave us? Well, for that, look at a traditional multi-threaded cache-based architecture. So if you, for example, do the, you know, the exercise that you want to have data in core three that is being produced by core two, if you look at it, you have to get that data as to sit, as to be replicated in the L0 a cache of core two, the L1 cache, uh, of core two in the um, L2 cache, and then all the way back to, to uh, core three. So you basically have about six instances at a certain moment in time of that data sitting in your memory. That de definitely doesn't is the most as, as, you know, uh, efficient way of using your memory. So there's a lot of data replica replication. On top of that, you know, this is not deterministic. A caching architecture is not deterministic. You never can predict, you know, how this architecture will behave. So that's another concern, thinks especially about edge applications. And then finally, you can see it, right? I mean, to get data from core two to core three, the, the many hops uh, you have to go through, it, you know, implicitly assumes a very high level of latency. So what we did is we created a data flow architecture where, you know, we from the start were making sure that this architecture was as efficiently as possible, leveraging an understanding of how the data was moving. 
So what we did was we allowed to create a customized data movement pattern you know, between the uh, different compute components in this architecture. For example, on the left here, you see uh, a pipeline nearest neighbor type of architecture, which you will see in video processing or wireless applications. Whereas, you know, when you look at um, machine learning, for example, where you want to have uh, the, the parameters shared by all the compute nodes in the network, um, you would like to have more like a broadcasting where, where you have the data sitting in one place in the memory and then you broadcast it to all the different uh, blocks, uh, leading to a much more efficient uh, communication pattern. So that was a, an important component of, uh, you know, how this architecture was catering to some of the challenges um, on the data side. And, you know, as I was explaining, another important aspect was to make sure that we had an adaptable memory architecture whereby, first of all, you know, we had different granularities of memories from very small memories, a few bits, to large memories of several megabits, um, tens of megabits, and, um, and then a pattern in how to connect them and kind of define the bandwidth depending on, you know, a certain workload has a high bandwidth, as you see on the right, another workload has a low bandwidth, and you can configure the memory, you know, the way you want. So that clearly led to a more efficient architecture from a, a respect of the latency in, in how your architecture behaved in latency tolerant applications. It also, you know, this is actually a very old slide, but it's still very relevant. It also allowed you to optimize by having, you know, finer granularity of memories to optimize your power consumption in accessing the memory. So ultimately, um, this architecture, we spend a lot of time in optimizing memory uh, to make sure that the data was moving as efficiently as possible, that we are only using the essential memory resources that were needed so that we could pack as much as possible data in our chip, that we were avoiding replication of data. Uh, all of this, you know, given the fact that data became such an important now that's about data. The other aspect is, of course, the uh, silicon is the te is the connectivity, and you know as we all know, I think this this audience knows it probably better than I, is that when scaling down, um, clearly the resistivity of your of your wires is increasing, leading to basically the fact that although you know your gate delays might you know, go down as you scale, the uh, delay of your connectivity is increasing, right? And, and on top of that, connectivity becomes a pretty important expensive component. You know, if you increase the density of your functionality in your chip, to give you an example, our adaptive system on chip, uh, our current family Versu, you know, has about 18 metal layers to kind of establish you know, the connectivity, the rich connectivity that we see necessary to build an efficient architecture. So connectivity uh, is very important. It is going in the wrong direction in terms of, you know, uh, the, first of all, the wires are not scaling as well as the logic. Um, it's hard to keep the data moving and keep it up to speed to some of the interfaces with the memories and so on. And of course, as I said before, you know, the delays of the wires is also increasing. So that led us to kind of uh, extending, just as we did with the granularity of the compute, we extended to a certain extent the granularity of the connectivity. Whereas in a traditional FPGA, you have a very rich uh, connectivity where every logic gate you know, can be connected to every other logic gate uh, on a bit per bit level, um, we kind of started to have a, a hierarchy of connectivity and we introduced a hardened NOC, um, a hardened network on chip. Uh, and in line with the great benefits you have with an FPGA, which is the very rich programmable interconnect, 
we made that a network on chip also to a large extent very programmable. Programmability meant you could decide about the topology, you could decide about the, the, the routes, uh, you could define the data width, the quality of service, you know, address mapping. Um, you know, every channel, vertical knock channel and a horizontal knock channel, they all had a number of physical channels that then, you know, could be uh, extended or could be uh, shared as eight virtual cha uh, channels. And what's also very important is, given, you know, our experience with FPGA is that whatever connectivity we came up with had to be scalable. You know, scalable in terms of low-end devices, high-end devices, and scalable towards the future generation of, of technologies. Um, so, an important component, of course, was then also that, as this was a programmable knock, part of our compiler flow needed to be capable to program this network on chip. And, you know, if, if you look at it, you know, in this specific case, you see uh, in the horizontal uh, network on chip, we have about four channels. In the vertical slices, you have about two channels. Uh, programming means making choices of which functions are connected to um, which ports in this programmable knock. It um, means programming the routes and programming the switches in this in this knock. Um, it also means, you know, uh, placing the functionality, the functions in the right places, you know, in the fabric. If you look at the top right, you see, for example, four functions that each are con uh, consuming resources of the fabric. You know, you have function which we refer to as fabric A, B, and C and D. And you see a connectivity pattern where some of these functions have a, a, a connectivity, a hierarchical connectivity to uh, the DDR or to the processor. Um, we see an overlap in some of these uh, diagrams, which means these functions are also connected on a wire basis. It means there is a very rich uh, wire-based connectivity. And the, the, the width of the arrows is giving you the bandwidth. So, the choices you have to make is now where are you placing these uh, different functions, fabric A, B, C, and D, uh, to what port on the vertical knock you connect them, uh, close to what um, hardware interfaces like DDR or processors do you put them. And, you know, when you look at these arrows and you look at the, you know, the bandwidth of these arrows, uh, you can see that the left solution is suboptimal compared to the right solution. Um, so this is kind of some of the new challenges that come now with, uh, with programming this kind of architecture. Now, as I said before, what's also very important is that this NOC is scalable. In other words, that the NOC allows you to, um, you know, if you have wider devices, you will have more VNOX, vertical NOX, you will have more channels. Um, and the NOC can even extend over the boundary of a die, right? And so that brings me to, you know, where you are in, in the monolithic adaptive uh, uh, system on chip. What you see is you have fabric, you have heterogeneous fabric, you have arrays of VLIW vector mesh uh, processors that scale in the X and the Y direction. You have programmable logic and you have memory that scales in embedded memory that scales in the X and the Y direction. And then you have a little bit of a challenge because the memory interfaces, you know, basically that are feeding this powerful uh, compute fabric, they only scale in one direction. And so therefore, when you go off the chip, you really have to start thinking about higher bandwidth for the wires that go off the die. And that basically brings, you know, uh, the challenges of the off-chip I.O. One of the observations that we see is that uh, I.O. in our dies is consuming more and more of the total allowable po uh, power that you can tolerate in a package. 
And um, you know, uh, as we if we see that if the trend continues as it's happening now, pretty much uh, in the nearby future, you can only build a die and a chip and a compute platform that has I/O and brings the data, but has no room for a compute because all the power that can be handled by the thermal solutions and the package is already consumed by uh, by the I/O. So therefore, you know, there is a strong evolution toward chiplets where you, you know, you're trying to bring the die in the packets so that you have to consume less power to communicate between the die. So you really, instead of having centimeters uh, of uh, wires and bowls of packages that you have to go through, you stay within the, uh, the package and you only have millimeters. And there are different technologies that are emerging. You know, have the you know packaging, you know chiplets that are relying on packaging using organic substrate, uh, which use ultra short reach transceivers, which can literally have terabit per second, um, you know, bandwidth. And these solutions typically are, are are good from a cost perspective, but are poor from a latency and also somewhat of a, you know, they are pretty worst case in terms of power. And on the other extreme, you have the silicon interposer where the substrate of the package is now silicon and you can leverage that and you can have very high, you know, small pitch uh, bandwidth between the dies, almost like, you know, like on a chip because in the end you use a, a silicon to do the interconnect. Um, this is probably a, you know, a good solution from a bandwidth and a latency perspective, but is still very expensive compared, for example, to the uh, you know, ultra short reach solution. And then you have something that combines both of both worlds a little bit, which is the wafer level packaging, uh, which is one of the new emerging capabilities um, that definitely brings the bandwidth but it's and is a little bit better in terms of latency and power than the organic substrate solution. Um, but it's still suffering somewhat from a cost perspective. So in Xonix, we have been using chiplets already since the 28 nanometer node. We used them to build big FPGAs out of small ones to deal with yield challenges. We used it to have heterogeneous integration of technologies, analog digital memory and logic. And then, you know, recently we used it for our largest FPGA we ever built, the largest FPGA in the industry, uh, the View 90P. So, you know, definitely chiplets is becoming a well-established solution. And actually, you know, we clearly see a trend also towards 3D, uh, where we, we now extend, um, you know, this towards really stacking active on active dyes. Um, that is already the case with HBM, where in an HBM you have a, a logic layer and on top of that multiple uh, memory layers. Um, now, that's a little bit easier than when you have all these uh, layers or active digital logic that are consuming a lot of power. And that creates actually uh, a challenge for power density. Because one of the other things that is creating problems by, by shrinking, of course, we increase the power density. And the power density is increasing exponentially. On top of that, you're now going to stack, you know, dyes on top of each other. And some of these layers are actually pretty poor thermal conductors and actually are isol isolating things. Um, you really are creating a problem. If every of these dyes is, is generating a lot of heat and power, uh, you know, in this specific case where you're stacking four dye, you're increasing the power density by a factor of five, uh, four you know, for the thermal and, and, and the mechanical uh, aspects of the packaging. And you start seeing more effort going into, you know, uh, tools and software and simulations about the combinations of thermal behavior of, of chips and, and how the cooling and the packaging um, should happen. Here you see an example of kind of a package um, in, in a, an automotive application for the, the rear view, uh, you know, in the rear view mirror uh, so connectivity, you know, between die and between packages is definitely becoming a challenge. And there is a kind of an unwritten rule that basically says that, you know, when you look at it from an electrical perspective, the boundary where you have to transition from electrical to optical is most probably about 100 gigabit per second meter. 
which means you can probably drive a one meter wire, you know, with a 100 gigabit per second using an electrical uh, solution. And, you know, on the right, you see some of the techniques that are being used for that. This is a PAM4 modulation scheme where you actually uh, transmitting multiple bits at the same time over the wire and you can get you know 100 gigabits or if you're a smaller distance than a meter you can get 200 gigabit and and even more so for chiplets it's probably good to have this uh, continued uh, serial transmitters but you know when you go beyond that clearly optical is becoming and that means that you know optical solutions and silicon photonics and so will become a must-have given the bandwidths that we are looking at, especially in applications like data centers. Uh, but we are still at the infancy of that. We, are, we have challenges in manufacturability, repeatability, you know, power density also. So clearly there are, there are challenges there, but there is, I mean, it is a, a technology that we will need to have at our uh, disposal in order to continue uh, to create, uh, to cater to this bandwidth bandwidth data center. So with that, I would like to conclude by saying that, um, you know, if you look at the mega trends in the industry, we will continue to see this exponential growth uh, in data that needs to be stored in data that needs to be computed and the bandwidth that takes care of the, you know, movement of the data. So that's clearly there and the technology I'm optimistic, will deliver that and will cater to that exponential growth. And to a certain extent, that's a confirmation of what Kurzweil defined as the law of accelerated return of technology. And I try to indicate a little bit today that clearly there is a whole new era coming towards us, which opens up a lot of opportunities for uh, innovation, specifically also in the domain of architectures where we see the emergence of programmable domain-specific architectures that will support scenarios of uh, heterogeneous compute. And then finally, um, we, you know, although more slow is slowing down, we have another, literally another dimension that we can start leveraging and we can go into the 3D and 3D chiplets are there uh, for sure to stay and will become more important. Thank you uh, for your attention.